So, enough of me yakking. I want to introduce one of the co-founders of Sonic Scoop, who's going to intro our next presenter. So, please welcome up to the stage, Mr. David Weiss. All right, thanks. All right. How's everyone doing? I want to hear more. Woo! Oh, yes. Do you feel like you're better mixers than you were two hours ago? All right. I know I do. All right. I told Justin that I wanted to introduce this next presenter because I kind of have a thing for electronic music. I produced a lot of it. None of it was anywhere near as good as what Matt Lang made. I've become a big fan of his music and his mixes as I've gotten to know his catalog. He does things uh, in the mix that I've really never even heard before. So we're excited to have him up here. We're very thankful to Plug In Alliance for making his presentation possible. Matt is a dynamite mixer, producer, artist, originally from New York, went to LA. He's back here today, produced and mixed for 30 Seconds to Mars. He's an artist on Mousetrap Records. He's worked on the Counter-Strike video game series, gotten a lot done, but in the here and now, he will be presenting for us a mix walkthrough. Matt Lang, come on up. So, um, what I'm going to do for you today is, I put out a record a week ago, it's called RUMI. I actually put it out on my own label, Isorhythm, only because I didn't have to deal with any other record labels to do that. So I did it myself. And it's a very, uh, very late night, underground, techno kind of record. And I'm just going to break you through some of the production process, the mix of it, and some of the plugins I'm using. And then I think we'll just open up this whole forum to a Q&A, questions, what have you. So before I do that, I'm just going to play you a little bit of the track, and then we'll start breaking it down. Are you, am I, the one each other so greatly desires? Within one and another, the truth remains strictly human. Are you, am I, the one each other so greatly desires? Are you, am I? form of techno, it basically does that for eight minutes. But, <laughs> um, but I'm going to start actually, uh, I'm going to start with the vocal only because they're on top. And the story behind the silly little vocal, um, I'm going to isolate it, but it's just a friend of mine, um, Denise Reno, and it's just... Are you, am I, the one each other so greatly desires? And there's a line that comes after that. Um, and actually, it was when I was working on the 30 Seconds to Mars record, um, Jared Leto came up and asked if I could actually find dialogue that they wanted to use for an intro to a song. 
And the idea was, you know, why don't you just look through these 10 hours of video footage, and then you can just pick stuff up. And I'm like, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so instead, um, I just pulled out a couple different um, philosophy books and like a book on existentialism, and I just chose a couple lines randomly and just kind of hacked together my own, uh, my own sentences, which is really theft, but if you, I mean, if the books are written 100 years ago, you can do it, right? So um, then I called Denise because her voice is way prettier than mine is, and I had her basically just uh, record it herself in her own little Toronto home studio, and she sent me all the takes, and I gave it to the guys, and they didn't want to use it. So it became mine, which is the best part of all that. So what's going on with her vocal? Um, if I take off all the processing, and there really is not much, to be honest. Um, what I did do, and I can only tell you I did it, I can't really show you, but um, I did time correct the vocal, and I just did that using the Pro Tools uh, time, Elastic Audio. And I just did it so actually, if you, uh, if you look at a tighter, um, a tighter split of the notes, you can see it's actually corrected to be pretty tightly to eighth notes, um, as opposed to she actually set it slower, and I just sped it up so that way uh, things would fall closer onto the beat, as even here it's Greatly. RU is right on the actual beat itself. But processing-wise, all I have is a a stereo with this air stereo with thing, and actually its function is not to do any stereo with, it's purely for automation. And what I do a lot of panning automation, so on the rare occasion that I've used it in moments like this, and there is some editing going on here too, instead of having your kind of just dead center, sorry. Truth. And there's some weird glitchy stuff in there too, but, um, this is a really easy way to get little things to spin around your head. The truth. And I'm hoping you can hear that in stereo, because I cannot. But um, all it is, is just very tight editing on the grid. And it's actually, it starts off kind of, uh, when you do these kind of things, it's, I'm not even uh, quantizing it at all, to be honest. I only quantize it once it got to be at roughly a 16th note, because before that, what was, you know, it's tight enough, it doesn't really matter um, if I wanted to do it in real time. I mean, it's really as simple as, and you can see that was 30 second notes right there. But it's just really basic audio editing ideas where the duplicate function is a really popular one. And you just take that and you get the, that kind of stuttery CD skipping thing. So, if you want it to get tighter and do the, like the, the retardando, basically the dun 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 kind of thing, it's as simple as just duplicating and then every time making it a little bit longer. And then essentially what I end up doing is once I get to basically a quantized value, then I start doing it at the quantized value. And very quickly, <laughs> you get those very like stutter edity but bouncing ball kind of stutters. So I do that kind of stuff a lot. And then the only other two things on this vocal are a reverb, and it's just the Valhalla vintage verb, um, which it's not my favorite reverb, but it really is effective. Um, it's got a, there's a thickness to it that sometimes works very effectively. And to be honest, I think this is just the default setting that came up minus the mix knob, and that I just, turned to 16% because that sounded right to me. But everything else, I just wanted it to just make the vocal blockier and give it a space, but it didn't have to be a natural space. I didn't care about that at all. I just wanted that vocal to just kind of float a little bit. And the last thing in the chain is an EQ. And for most of my, uh, I guess, surgical EQ work, I always use DMG Audio Equilibrium. Um, I used to really like the previous version, Equality, and equilibrium still to this day is, it's just my go-to. I like it, I know it, and it's what I use all the time. So all I have going on is a high pass, and I'm cutting her at 123. And then I don't know what mic she used at home, and um, you know, her, her recording chain is less than ideal, 
So there were some very sibilant moments. And as opposed to using a de-esser, um, I just actually notched out uh, a frequency at 2600 roughly, and then also 6K. And I'll play you the difference between the two, but I mean, it's, it's pretty much what you would expect. The one each other so greatly desires. And then if we take the those out. The one each other so greatly desires. The one each other so greatly desires. It's really in this greatly part. On each other so great. Yeah. On each other so 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 on It just evens it out a little bit. Um, it's nothing crazy, but it works very effectively on her. And I basically have the same plugin chain on. I think almost every iteration of spoken word. Actually, yeah, there's actually only a little bit. Because then what I end up having is all these other versions, these are basically all affected versions of D. So even when I have, sometimes it's just only one region on an entire channel. But in the case of this, it's just a delay throw. Am I? Am I? Am I? Am I? Am I? And there's. N I guess if you layer it with the original. Am I? Am I? Am I? Am I? The one each other. You could automate a bunch of different plugins. I don't like to do that. Instead, I really prefer just to actually, I print a lot of things using the audio suite function in Pro Tools. But I just want, a lot of times what I'll do, and I'll take just very, the very end of one word, or the end of a sentence, one word, and then maybe I'll do a delay throw on that, or a reverb tail, anything just to give a little bit of spice to that one, that one element. And if you do it over the entire phrase, it might get a little bit too washy, but especially in a genre like techno, where what makes techno interesting, at least in my opinion, is the space. And of course, the more minimal your arrangement is, the more, the more weight each element is going to carry. So little interstitial effects, like just one delay throw every now and then, or one reverb, or whatever, that's going to be a lot more powerful, especially when you hear it in a club setting where it's loud. If you put a lot of information into that mix, a lot of it's going to get lost except for the kick drum. So the more sparse you are, the more effective little effects will actually be. So that is why I tend to do that with vocals. And you'll see later when I get to the drums, I do that a lot also there too. And that's pretty much all of her. Everything is just that initial phrase and then various effects all the way through. Again, here is more delay throws. Am I? Am I? Am I? Am I? Just glitchy. And that is, again, it's a similar idea to how I did it before. Um, I did this using Native Instruments Reactor, but I just, I took her vocal, and this Reactor Ensemble, it's a granulizer where you can time stretch or you can compress the timing of a vocal, or any sound, but in this case I put a vocal, and it just very slowly scanned through her vocal itself, and that's why you get this. And it's a fun little effect. Um, there's space between every, uh, every grain of hers. That's what you call every slice is a grain. So instead of it being blurry, it almost sounds like a tremolo, but it stretches it out. So I'm going to go to the drums now. And it starts off, uh, I just have one kick channel. There aren't a ton of things. There's nothing layered in the actual session. The kick on its own is this. It came from two different kicks originally, and I'll show you what they were, but it is nothing too intense. Um, and I can activate these. Or I cannot. If I do that and that, will we get it? Great. So. Both of these are kicks I just made at home. Uh, the first one's this stay kick. 
It's shorter. Um, it's got more of a high-end attack. Uh, it came from a remix I was working on. And then the second is called Titan Subby, which is very descriptive. And that's all it is. It came from a, a modular synthesizer, but um, I, record, I got some Neve pre's in the past year, and uh, so I started recording all my kick drums through them, and it really makes things really warm and subby. So these two things are layered together, and then they're going through two plugins. The first is just the, uh, the Manly Massive Passive, which is honestly doing nothing except rolling off a little bit of high end. Um, and then finally, I'm using that Eventide Elevate, and, or Newfangled Audio Elevate. And I use this thing absolutely a ton. Um, it just, I use it on drums when I'm making things as well. It's usually my final master. But this limiter in general has just become a really important tool in my workflow. And especially when you're combining, uh, when you're combining kicks or something like that, Limiting really compression in general, but really slamming it can really tighten up your kick a lot, um, and it can make things that shouldn't work together somehow work. And you can, I mean, if you looked at these kick channels too, you would see I actually don't have, there is no EQ on either, which is really because I just felt like I didn't need to. But what the limiter is actually doing, I'm going to play the kicks without it, and then I'll play with it. So here's without. Here's with. And it's not doing a ton. There is a little bit of transient design going on. So if you could push it really far, that's too much for me. But right around there, I like that. And then there's some drive too that what sounded right to me was just a little bit. And there is a little bit of gain, but that's all the thing is doing. And those things ultimately ended up getting rendered down. And I'm going to hide these again. And that became the main kick here. And uh, I actually didn't even talk about the master chain at all, which I should have a little bit. But um, it's not in here. But I always have a massive passive. And it's, you, there's always a little bit of um, high and low cutting, but then usually a little bit of adding some very, like, 15k or something like that, taking out a little bit about a little around 200. Um, just in the case of the kick, it wasn't doing anything. But um, I should mention this stuff because Plugin Alliance was very kind enough to send me here, and um, and this is this is truthful. This is actually in the session, um, and it's what ultimately this up here. That is the actual print of the track, and what I had going on was a uh, I have this. They have the new, uh, this new bus compressor. It's a townhouse. It's based similarly on like an SSL bus compressor, but it's vibier. It's a little bit dirtier, and it's cool. Um, so I used that to actually just take off really 2 dB, if even that, of reduction. It's not doing a lot of work. Maybe three. And then the other one, and this thing is amazing. Um, yeah, ever since I got the black box, I mean, it's actually... It's on every master now. And what it's doing, um, it's just a little bit of saturation. And I keep the saturation really low. But without it, um, it also clips your signal in a very nice way, where you can end up getting a little bit louder. But it brings out your sides in such a beautiful way, whereas without it, it sounds fine. But It just makes everything a little bit wider, and there, there's an excitement to it. So, I mean, this, the black, block, the black box plugin is amazing. And then also, on the end of every, probably for the past seven years, every master I've done, and a lot, this would usually happen in the mastering section, but because um, I always use a different session for mastering, the Brainworks, the digital EQ, has been on everything. Um, and mainly, I just use it for the mono maker section because I have a lot of sub bass in my work. But the ability to just mono anything underneath, in this case, I chose 80, which is low, but it's a very subby record. That allows me to really tighten up everything and then cleans up the issues with 
stereo subs, which I often like a lot. So this is just, it's on every chain ever, and it's amazing, even for just doing the simplest thing, which in this case is summing the mono, but I love it. Then we have the claps and the snaps. And these, the RU snap, um, I recorded that at home, and the MD snare came out of an Electron machine drum, but the snap I just recorded in my little home studio, and it's just in front of mics. And I recorded it twice, or actually four times, but um, actually no, this time it's twice. So you can see it's a different recording left and right, and what I did actually, just to give it a little bit of variation, you can see, if you look closely at the waveform, I flipped the channels on the, uh, on the first snap. You can see the left channel is on the left. And on the second snap, that left channel is now on the right. And it's subtle, but what that does is every time it hits, there's just a slight variation. And it's just a little... It, it, I find any little variation you do generally is going to add something special. So I do that a lot. And then what it's going through, I have it going through the Brainworks SSL. And I really, I've always liked SSL style EQs in general. And I've always liked the compressor too, because it's there was just this uh, a snappiness to the SSL compressor. So this is a brand new plugin. And when I got it, I really wanted to try it out. And I just threw it onto this thing. And it made a big difference, because without it, a little bit weaker. This really makes it snappier. There is a little bit of EQ going on. Um, it's just adding some high end without it, with it. And then that gets layered with a snare. And this snare is just straight out of the drum machine. It's also going through equilibrium, which is taking out a lot without it. It really thins it out. And I took out that frequency around um, 2K because that's kind of the same frequency that the snap's hitting at. So if you add it back in, and you add the snap, there they play nicely together. And it's just making room for the snap. It's as simple as that. Now, this is actually a really, I really like this because I've never actually really used vinyl crackle. And for a lot of my friends who, um, they were big house music heads, they are always like trying to sample, you know, drums off vinyl or whatever because it has a thing. I don't get it. I only bought a vinyl record player for the first time two years ago. But I ended up, uh, I just, I fell asleep one night on the couch and in kind of, you know, true vinyl romantic form, I wake up and, you know, the thing's spinning around and I just hear the crackle. But it sounded really cool, so I ended up recording it. And it ended up being this just very stereo crackle. And once again, just like the vocal, I took it into Pro Tools and I, uh, I time corrected it so that way it would, uh, it's actually highly quantized, so every little click is gonna fall exactly on a 16th note. Um, hang on, I'm gonna do one thing. Follow, no, I don't want it to follow playback. But there's two little tricks with this that I like. And if you look closely, every time there's a downbeat, there's a fade. So what that's doing is every time the kick hits, the little crackle is getting ducked down just slightly. But what it does is so every time you have your thumpy kick, whatever, there is nothing but that thump. But together, you would never really hear the ducking, I guess, together? Sorry, that is not a, the most descriptive way to put it, but they complement each other this way. So it's almost like the vinyl crackle is like washing itself around the kick drum. 
And that was the idea of that. And then also, once again, using equilibrium, all I'm doing is just taking out the very low end of the crackle. Then I have a couple hi-hats, and one follows on the downbeat, which is this one. Sorry, kick drum. And one follows on the upbeat. And if memory serves me correctly, they were actually both made from the same hi-hat. The difference is this one is way thinner sounding. And part of that is, once again, this is going through the SSL, the, uh, the Brainworks SSL. And it's doing a little bit of work, not a ton, but without it, it's a little bit duller. With it, it just gives it a little bit of air. And once again, all the little intricacies make a big difference, I find, in the end result. The other hi-hat is also just going through. Oh, God, would you just stop doing this? Um, that's annoying. It's just going through the same kind of EQ work, once again, taking out low end, adding a little bit of high end, ducking out a little bit around 1K, which was just a little aggressive for me. So it just smooths it out. And then lastly, there's some other stuff, but um, for the most part of this section, I have glitchy perk. And it's not happening all the time. It only happens on uh, basically the first two beats and then the second beat of, uh, I guess, each every two bar. What it is, is uh, it's stuff I actually made on a modular synthesizer. And I kind of took a bunch of field recordings, ran it through a granulizer, and just started turning knobs. And a big part of my workflow, a lot, will be just experimenting, you know, where you just try to make a lot of weird noises that they don't have to make sense. Um, but the minute you start having a tactile response to the sounds that you're making, um, they not only do you really end up with a, a personal connection to it, but I honestly think it sounds better because there is a human variation in what you do. You can obviously tell in this. That's a joke. Uh, <laughs> but it's supposed to fly around your head. And once again, it's complementing everything else in the percussion because nothing else is theoretically hitting at the same time. And that's the idea of just having, again, it's, I like these little moments that just pop out. I like little variations. Later, we got a few other things. We got some little metals, um, and it's just to, it's just a simple little pattern. Once again, um, I have it going through a filter because the filter gets automated, and it's just a way to kind of introduce it in a way that isn't Immediate. Fires. Are you? Am I? Am I? Am I? Am I? Am I? Again, subtle variation, but I like subtle. It works. And then it's going through just plug-in wise. Uh, I have it going through the Brainworks Room reverb, and. It's just adding space. It's making it hide a little bit in the back of the mix. And this reverb, I found, is a very effective way. Um, I wouldn't use it for crazy affected reverb, but for placing an object in an almost more realistic space, this reverb is terrific for it. So without it, it sounds like this. With it, and that's subtle, but that would be it wet all the way. And it just makes the little metal just duck a little bit into the background, hide a little bit, give it more of an ambience. And then finally, all the drums themselves, they go through a big drum bus. And I will solo all of them so you can hear what it's all doing. There is some automation going on on the drum bus because, well, for the first part, I have a reverb. And the reverb, it's the FabFilter Pro-R, which 
I forgot to license on this laptop. But um, I don't work on a laptop, to be honest. I, I work on a studio computer, and I had to get the session running here. But uh, that's unprofessional on my part. But um, I don't know if it's going to work, actually. But what it does is basically when we have, uh, there's a breakdown that happens. And I want to get lots of noise and a, a lot of energy. And a great way to do it is just to suddenly wash out a lot of things in reverb. So let's, I'm curious if this will work. But. Once again, it's just adding ambience. That's without it. So that plus the other effects we have going on in this breakdown where everything gets really washed out. Um, the effect of doing that is that when your drop happens, as you will, it's the sheer contrast. It's, you have this juxtaposition of everything being washed out. There is no longer really any clear transients. And when it all comes back in, and we also, I took out the low end, which is something I'll show you also later, you go from basically sheer noise to a very hard transient syncopated rhythm. And the two things together, it makes, especially when you're dealing with a dance floor, it makes that moment seem bigger and actually more exciting. So I'll actually just go from here and go through that part. So the other things going on in this riser breakdown section, um, I have a big printed reverb of the drums, which came separately. And that's underneath it. I mean, it really functions just as noise. But it cuts the total silence. And I also have this grain crash, which is it's a, just a crash symbol, but very time stretched and reversed. that cuts purely to silence. And her vocal is doing something very similar also, where, um, again, it's another granular process, which if you haven't realized by now, like granular synthesis is one of my favorite techniques ever. And it's that same idea of taking one word and then affecting it. The truth. Are you? Am I? Up and up and up and up and up, and at the same time, you have this stuff. It's a lot, but it makes it exciting. And also, throughout the entire track, we have you know, there's the sub bass that's just it doesn't do anything but that. But the sub fades out, actually, as everything else is starting to fade in. So you take all the low end energy out, while everything just becomes high end. So that way, when the kick and the bass all come in later together, again, it's somewhat a psychoacoustic trick that makes it sound heavier, because you forgot that there was low end. Effects-wise, in general, it's mostly noise. Um, throughout the entire track, there are like little noise blasts, like these things and they just fall on the snares. But it's just little moments, once again, that the little moments make everything.
And that's actually a, I think I picked that trick up from um, Dubfire, the techno artist. He would do a lot of things like that, and I just really like the sound of it. And it's everywhere, to be honest. It's just like little noise, pssst, which also works very well in a club. Then I have these things as well, which the instrument they came from, you're actually going to hear later because that originally, it was a string instrument. Um, but it's just, if you take a, it's the rattle of a cello bow string, essentially. But if you take all the low end out of it, you're left only with just the crackle itself of the bow on the string. And it's really messed up. It's, it's an error kind of thing. So you take all the low end out, and you have just the high. Then um, I pitch shifted it, because why wouldn't you want to pitch shift something? And so it goes through a That plus a reverb, which this time around I use the Native Instruments uh, replica. Sometimes I just choose different delays, or I guess in this case it's delay, just for the sake of doing something different. Um, there wasn't any particular reason. But the great thing that this re or I'm sorry, this delay does, it actually has a pitch shifter within the actual um, reverb chain, or I'm sorry, delay line itself. So what you hear, I'm just going to do that part, without the pitch shifter, with it, where the left and right channels are being slightly different from one another, the left's up six semitones, the right's up four, and they're ping-ponging. Now the trails, they just kind of dissolve as they get floatier. And once it's going through a sidechain compressor, and for this, I just use the plain old Avid compressor. There is nothing fancy about it, but it works extremely effectively. And that's going to be any time I do sidechain compression. It's always that. Bass-wise, it's just the sub. And the one thing that is crucial about the bass is if I put it up underneath the kick, if you look at the waveform, you'll see every time the kick hits, the bass doesn't. So what that does, you never have low end fighting each other, ever. And the simple idea, I actually learned it from drum bass guys, because they do this a lot, is, and I'll do it for you now, um, instead of using sidechain compression, which can be a little bit finicky, well, let's play them together first, and it's a pretty obvious difference. And I'm just going to do that. It's going to sound ugly, but whatever. They're fighting each other. So instead of using a sidechain compressor, which A, has to rely on the timing of your kick, if there's going to be an attack, who knows if there's any plug and delay compensation going on, that's weird. We just do it with audio fades now. So just in Pro Tools, I'll just add fades, and then I will just hard into the audio, and I'll adjust the curve to essentially be the inverse of the decay of the kick itself. So what that does is it almost is like the sub itself is literally hugging the kick. So the minute the kick starts to release, the sub is coming back in to just hug it. There's no other word to really describe it. But together, it really, it's such a big difference between you're going to hear a side with it and a side without. And it just means that kick is going to come through so much clearer every time. And also, it means you don't need to do as much compression later, because you basically, you essentially did manual compression. But I do this now almost any time I am working with a kick and sub bass. And sometimes not even sub bass. I've done it with other instruments just because I want that ducking feeling that is actually going to be more extreme than if you did it with a compressor. And then, since it's audio, you have a lot more control because it's not an automated process, it's manual. And I always find manual, it takes longer, but it's a lot more, in the end, I find it to be a lot more expressive. So a big hook of this track 
is the strings. And they are actually, in my mind, what kind of makes the whole track interesting to me. And they, they add a creepiness, and this is what they are. And there's a little melody. And they also function as a turnaround. They're, um, they essentially function as an introduction to when another element is going to happen, just arrangement-wise. And they're not real. I totally faked them. Um, I used LA scoring strings, and I just went to town trying to layer things. And it works. Basically, I have simple legato strings against the tremolo version of the legatos. And the legatos are this. And tremolos are this. And I have, it's simple, I mean, it's uh, just viola, cello, and bass every time. There is a violin in the tremolo. For this guy, it's the viola that carries the melody. And everything else is just supporting it underneath. And it's all based around basically a chord motion of, uh, if I remember correctly, it's just essentially B minor going up to D minor, which is kind of creepy. And then there's some other, uh, other notes going there, some tensions that you know pull it out a little bit. But that is, to me, the hook of the track. This whole track is based around creepy strings plus a kind of eerie vocal. And then everything else, it's all just complementary to the fact that I like these things the most. What's going on plugin-wise? Let me go to all of, or take a moment where there's a lot of stuff going on. Which would be, yeah, let's do that one. So the strings are EQ'd pretty hard. And the reason is, I wanted them to feel old and kind of, they're creepier, I find, if they're a bit muted. I took a lot of low end out. And I took a lot of high end out. But this puts them out in the distance. And the distance, again, makes it slightly off-putting and you know the note choice is the note choice is creepy in the first place so then you put it in a space that seems kind of creepy and farther away and it just accentuates the whole idea and then i have them going through the eventide black hole and as far as effect reverbs go i mean this thing is amazing it's the kind of space you can create with this thing i mean i I still have a, a 1994 Eventide DSP 4000 that for the past seven years has only lived on one algorithm, and that was black hole. <laughs> so having it in plug-in form is something that it's just completely indispensable to me. And I also have these bass rumblers. So there was that moment before where I showed you there was just the high-end crackle, and it was going through a pitch shift of delay. That is the same exact thing as this. The only difference is this has all the low end, and there is no pitch shift of delay. And it's just functioning purely as when it happens on a downbeat, it pushes that downbeat further. Um, if we go to a moment like here. The one each other so greatly designed. Are you? Am I? Simple as that. But again, random interstitial element that just every time it happens, pushes you further. 
And there are only two other real parts of this song. Um, there are piston drones, and this once again came from a, uh, a modular synthesizer, a module in particular called a Harvest Man Piston Honda. And what they do, they actually just basically give you a tonal center um, because the track itself is actually an E. And it only appears towards really the moments in the song when there's the most going on. And the way it's being done, um, it's actually, it was just a drone at first. And I added some EQ, which again, mostly just take out all the low end. Some compression via the uh, Empirical Outs Arouser, which is another one I use a lot. Which is just honestly gaining it at this point. There is a filter, and that's just used to automate the introductions of it. There is some sidechain compression. But what's giving it its pulse is this unfiltered audio biome. And the way it does that is so basically, I looked at this almost as if I was using a modular synthesizer, because this is a modular effects plugin. So what I am doing, I am just modulating essentially the gain of the thing. And I'm doing that by essentially I attached a quarter note or an eighth note, uh, an eighth note LFO to trigger an envelope. And the envelope itself affects the, out, the output gain. So. You could just do it with a, uh, a tremolo plugin if you wanted, but what I liked about this is that I can actually then theoretically modulate the duration of the envelope itself so it's not a static pulse. So I could elongate or shorten it. And you can change the curve too. And also, if I wanted to, I could change the frequency at when the envelope's being triggered by modulating the frequency of the LFO. And it's also going through the granulator. And what the granulator is doing. Um, it's splitting up the sound into a bunch of little grains. The grains are all set to be 178 milliseconds. I didn't use a calculator, I just did it by ear and that sounded fine to me. And what they're also doing is being pitch shifted up an octave. So I have it mixed down pretty far, but if I bring it up, It just adds a little bit of air, and it's cool. I do a lot of things just because, at least musically, because they're cool. I mean, if it's sonically interesting, why wouldn't you? So that is how I did it with this. And uh, it's a very fun plugin, because you can just kind of drop and drag modulators to anything, much like you could with an actual modular synthesizer. And then finally, I have some pads underneath all of it. and. They just float. There is nothing. They serve no function other than ambience. But they're mixed in as well with the piston drone. And these things are the only thing that are actually really providing a tonal center, because everything else is a little bit off.
And those, they're a simple, again, it's not complicated. This is just EQ work. Um, very, very, very EQ'd. <laughs> but that's because um, the way they were created is a function called convolution, much like uh, convolution reverbs, as you all know, where you have an impulse of a room that essentially gets multiplied onto your signal itself. This is taking the reverb out of it. So it's, I can tell by the name of it. I would never remember otherwise. But what I did is, using a very old program called SoundTac from the 90s, um, you take the concept of convolution, but it has nothing to do with reverb. What I had, I had a pad, just a, some boring pad, and then some sine waves. And multiplying the frequency of the pad against the frequencies of the sine waves itself, the end result ended up being this blur. And because you have frequencies being multiplied together, there is going to be buildup a lot of the times. I mean, it almost sounds like it's going to clip. So that's why I have them very highly bandpassed. And it just, it's air. It's also going through a compressor. And then it's going through a delay. And for this, I'm using the Sound Toys Echo Boy. Just in ping pong mode, spreads it out even further. And there's a variation underneath it as well, which also pulses. It's as simple as that. And I find the whole purpose of them really is, in general, when everything else is extremely atonal, um, I just personally need some form of melodic, uh, a melodic context to hold everything together. And especially at the very end, the way, uh, the way the song climaxes is after all the noise, it drops into a complete atonal melody, which is just computer bleeps and blips. They were made on a modular synth, but I mean, there is no traditional harmony to that or melody at all. It's just when it works in the context of everything else, you have all this excitement building up to it, and then you add this whole new element that hasn't been heard in the rest of the track. And to, like honestly, every time I've played it out in a club, that is the version, or that's the moment when suddenly people people's hands really get in the air because you add all this motion and weight coming up to it and then you add this very piercing melody on top and it's a very effective tool and the other cool thing that I really like about the breakdown and this is just kind of my own version of thinking I'm clever is that when the drop happens it doesn't happen on the first beat it happens on the second so usually if you had, say, a breakdown, and you know, okay, uh, one, two, three, four, uns, uns, whatever, this doesn't do that. Um, this goes for the one, two, three, four, five, and then snaps. And it also gives people a little bit of a jump. So it's unexpected. It hits with the melody. A lot of things happen all at once, and it kind of freaks people out. And that's why it's effective. Are you? Two, Am three, I? Four. And that's basically the entire breakdown of the track. Um, there are certain things I've done just arrangement-wise where periodically, you know, here's another example of just having something that fades in only momentarily. And it's the only time you ever hear this the entire time. And it's just a signal. Basically, it's actually, it's a note to me because it's, you have the kick, the kick comes out and this is essentially where the outro happens. So to me, this is a cue that I know, okay, I should start mixing the next record in because that musically, since most tracks happen in you know, roughly 16 to 32 bar phrases or something like that, if I give myself that cue, I know that when I bring in the next track, say 32 bars later, it's going to sync up 
perfectly with whatever action is happening in that track. So it's just little mental notes I make to myself that I'm sure other DJs you know, do similar things as well. That is just how I did it in this context. And that is basically the entire breakdown of RUMI. Let's give a big round of applause to Mr. Matt Lang. Thank you. And please keep it going just a little bit longer for Plugin Alliance making this possible. They're all over his master bus chain. Big round of applause for Plugin Alliance for making this happen.